<laughs> there we are. Hey everybody, it's me Amanda with Once in a Wild and welcome back to Once in a Wild Wednesday where each and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time we bring the zoo to you virtually right here via live stream form on Facebook and on YouTube. So welcome back if you are a returner and if this is your first time joining us here at Once in a Wild, um, we are a mobile zoo based in San Antonio, Texas, which is why we're on Central Standard Time, of course. And uh, we can bring the zoo to your classroom, to your daycare, to your birthday party to your nursing home facility to your home for any reason um, and to any event that you think animals would make it better which is every event right we can be outdoors indoors and we have birds mammals reptiles creepy crawlies amphibians um, and all sorts of animals so without further ado let's go ahead and get started <laughs> <laughs> now, once again, if this is your first time joining us and you are a little curious about what we do, you can find more information at onceinawild.com, which is our website, of course. And our contact number is always down below for your convenience as well. If you love what you see today and you want more, you can check out all of our YouTube, um, basically videos that we have banked up over the time these last couple of years. <laughs> well, at least one year. It feels like a couple of years, hasn't it? But we've been doing live streams for a while now, and uh, we have many of them actually saved up on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, I do highly recommend doing that if you are interested in animal information or you just cannot get enough from today. <laughs> I don't blame you. So you can actually go and check out the rest of our videos. We do have a live stream playlist, and we've got a couple other playlists. Please check that out for us. That is a free way to help us out is by subscribing and checking out our videos on YouTube. You can also follow us on social media, including Facebook, where we live stream as well each and every Wednesday evening at 6 30 p.m central time which is right now and um also we have other social media like TikTok and Instagram and Twitter so if you guys want to check us out on any of those platforms that is very very helpful as well all of the links are always conveniently located down below in the description box but you can also find them at onceinawilds.com very conveniently as well and if you want to actually book your own animal encounter, whether in person here in the South Texas area or virtually to anyone all over the world, as long as you have internet and some sort of virtual platform that we can jump on, like Zoom is probably the most popular, right? Um, we can do a Zoom animal encounter for you as well. So if you're interested in an in-person or virtual animal encounter of any kind, um, please let me know by contacting us at onceinawild.com or via my number down below, and we can get you started on that as well. That's the best way to help us out, of course. We do depend on your donations, your purchases, and your contribution to help us feed our animals, take care of our animals, pay our staff, and make sure that we are still chugging along and doing well with our little zoo. We are an outreach company, which is basically an education type company, right? But we also do provide animal therapy as well as just fun animal experiences for all ages. That is what we do in a nutshell. We've got all sorts of animals, including this one right next to me, which we'll talk about in just a moment but we've got something a little bit for everybody. But that is a great free way to help us out by following us on social media or um, uh, not really free, but a great way to help us out where you get something in return is going to be booking your own animal experience, of course. And the possibilities are kind of limitless. So just let us know what you're interested in and we'll help you out as best we can, right? Now, another way you can help us out too, before I forget to mention this, um, our programming each and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central on our live streams, which is right now, is free. We don't charge anything, but we do accept donations, of course, because our zoo does have a lot of animals to feed. <laughs> so we do appreciate any donations and tips that you would like to give us. And we have several options for that. One is gonna be Venmo, which is right here. One is gonna be Cash App, which is right there. And we also have PayPal as well as our Amazon wish list, which where, where we have actually selected um, items for the animals that you can pick out and just send to us. That's a great way to help us out too and helps out quite a bit because a lot of it is animal supplies and food and fun things for the animals to do and things like that. So today if you haven't um seen the description already we are going to be feeding one of our snakes and she is right here next to me in her uh feeding tank here this isn't her usual home um it's a little barren right now as you can see there is some um 
some mulch in there. It's actually a cypress blend mulch that we use for most of our reptiles. Um, but this is normally going to have like a hide in it and plants and a water bowl, of course, for her to live in, right? But this is not her home. I just wanted to make sure that you guys could see her eating today because we are going to be feeding her right here on the live stream, which is always a lot of fun. It's been a little while since I've done a snake feeding here on the live stream. I do them every now and then. But today ended up being a, being a feeding. That's hard to say. <laughs> today ended up being a feeding day for some of our snakes like Harley Quinn here, the corn snake. And so I figured I would just share that with you today because a lot of people are interested in watching a snake eat. Now I do apologize. It is a little bit far from the camera. This is like right up close. And ideally you'd be able to see her a lot better, but this is the best I could do with the time given to me today. Um, so I just set it up quickly to be able to um, feed her right here on the live stream, but hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. And she won't be the only animal that we have on today. We're gonna be feeding our snake first. I've learned my lesson because it tends to take some time. So we're actually gonna feed the snake first and let her eat and hopefully she'll eat right here in the front where she's at now. And you'll be able to see all of that process. And then while she's eating, we can probably move on to the next animal. And we brought three total animals for you guys to meet today. We actually do have over 70 individual animals here at, at uh, Once in a Wild. That's who we are. Once in a while, <laughs> I blank for a second, guys. This is real life. So with us here at our facility, is that what it, that's what I meant to say. With us, we have over 70 animal individuals and not that not quite that many species. Some of them are repeats, <laughs> um, but we brought three of them today, three of our individuals out of 70. Um, so there's always all sorts, all sorts of different choices and options that could be on the live stream. So you never know what's going to show up today. So today we brought a corn snake. We also have two other animals as well, totally different from a corn snake. Last week, we actually compared and contrasted a uh, scorpion and a tarantula to discuss what makes them similar and to discuss what makes them different. And that was kind of your creepy crawly uh, encounter last week. And before that, the week before that, we actually compared and contrasted a ball python his name is Prince and a hedgehog and her name is Shirley. And we talked about what makes them different and what makes them the same. So check those out if you haven't already. They were very, very interesting if I do say so myself. So the last couple of weeks, we only had two animals on the live stream, but we usually bring about three and sometimes more, sometimes less. Sometimes we are going to have like a theme to where we have less, um, maybe even just one animal for that day. For example, we did a really, really long, long live stream about one animal for Easter. And that of course was about our rabbit, Sandor. Sandor is a Flemish giant rabbit. He is really big and he was um, out on the table for the whole live stream. I was so proud of him. It was almost two hours. That's how long I can talk sometimes. I do not have a problem uh, filling up the time, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but we were discussing um, if a rabbit is the right pet for everyone. And of course it isn't. Um, and we were talking about how people sometimes impulse buy pets like rabbits um, for Easter and for birthday gifts for their children and things like that. And if you are curious about that information, we have a, like I said, a whole live stream all about rabbits. And I do know that it's not for everybody to sit for two hours and learn about rabbits, but it is really, really important if you are adopting any animal whatsoever to get your information before making that decision. Or if you've already, you know, made that decision. Maybe you want all the information you can get and that's very responsible of you. And that's a great source right there. Um, the video that we did a few weeks ago around Easter time, you can check that out. My point is that sometimes we have just one animal. Sometimes we have two animals. Sometimes we have five animals, depending on the theming that I'm doing. But today we brought three animals and one of them is Harley Quinn, the corn snake. Now corn snakes are actually my most favorite of all the reptile type animals, <laughs> which there are many, many of them, right? Um, as far as reptiles go, if you are interested in a pet reptile, this is my number one recommendation for a pet reptile for most families. Now I don't recommend just getting them for kids, no reptiles and no animals in general are toys, but as far as, um, care for a reptile. They're super easy. Corn snakes, especially when we live in a warm climate, like where I live in Texas, they don't need a lot of heat. They don't really need a lot of humidity either, but they do need an occasional misting, um, but not like on a daily basis if you don't want to. Um, they are this this species of corn snake, this type of corn snake, they, they are the species, that is the species, but the other name for the corn snake is the red rat snake. But this type of corn snake, the Okatee, is mostly found in Florida, but there are corn snakes over in Georgia, Louisiana, and surrounding states to all those ad adjacent states as well. Um, So they're more in the eastern United States, like southeastern. They're definitely used to a warmer climate, but they actually do well in almost any type of home, um, as long as you're um, climate controlled in your home. They do very, very well. 
well. And if your home is not very cold, you don't even really need any heat source for these animals as long as they have a warm room to be in. And as long as they have a water bowl to one side and a hide to the other side, and maybe even two hides, that's fine too. You can even make their home nice and big if you want to. But I always put the, the water on one side, that way they kind of have a cooler and even more humid one side. And then the other side is a little more dry and they have maybe some plants and a hide to hide underneath. But corn snakes are actually not a very nervous type snake. As you can see, she's crawling around right now. She knows what time it is. It's going to be feeding time soon. They are wonderful animals to handle as well. They're typically not going to bite you. They're typically not aggressive towards humans or even defensive, even though a lot of snakes are defensive sometimes. Now, a wild corn snake may not want to be picked up and may, you know, bite you. But even their bite, even if they did bite you, it wouldn't be that bad. Um, their teeth are very tiny. They have basically Velcro for teeth which can stick to your skin if you get bitten, but it's really not that severe. Um, also, they're non-venomous. Of course, they're non-venomous. I wouldn't recommend any venomous snakes for just anybody to have as a pet. This is my number one recommended pet reptile. They're also extremely hardy, easy to take care of, and uh, they can live a long time. These corn snakes can live, I mean, into their 20s very, very easily, maybe even more sometimes. Some snakes can live, in, li live even longer than that, and they're um, almost never going to get ill as long as you're taking good care of them. Now, like all snakes, they can be escape artists. So we've got some weights on top of her <laughs> uh, temporary feeding display enclosure today. Normally she does have the cage clips, which clip to the side and um, basically tightly secure this lid. It is a similar setup, but she has a lot more going on in her actual home, like a water bowl hide and a bunch of plants and pretty things to, to be in and live around, right, Harley? And um, again, these guys are actually pretty easy to care for. They only eat about once a week. Um, I recommend anywhere from seven to 10 days um, on a regular basis to feed a corn snake. Um, they have a little bit of a higher metabolism and eat more often than say a python or a boa constrictor, especially as a young corn snake like she is. She is around a third of what she will be. So she's a, th a third grown. So she's not really a baby anymore. She's kind of like a teen corn snake. Um, but these guys, the younger they are, the more often they're gonna wanna eat. But you can probably feed them every 10 days once they're adults very easily, maybe even every 15 days. They, they do very well like that. Um, snakes in general don't have to eat every day for sure. And when you do feed them, corn snakes always eat. I've never, ever had a corn snake refuse food which is fantastic. And you might be thinking if you're new to snakes that um, like, what's what's up with that? Why would you say that? Do some snakes not eat? Yes, some snakes do not eat. Um, so for example, ball python. Ball pythons are wonderful handling snakes. They're very docile and they're very impressive looking and uh, very cute at the same time. But sometimes ball pythons do not want to eat for you. In fact, I have a ball python named Princess and Princess will actually refuse food for months on end sometimes. In fact, she just ate last week and I'm so thrilled about it because she hasn't eaten in a while. So I'm very excited to announce that she did finally eat for us and she ate a great big rat. So she actually really doesn't have to eat for a while if she doesn't want to, but I'm hoping that she will eat again the next time I offer her food. And luckily here at Once in a Wild, no food goes to waste around here. The rats and the mice and et cetera, feeders, even the bugs will get eaten by somebody, by one of our 70 animals, right? Um, so Harley is showing you why they call them the corn snake. Um, corn snakes have a different pattern on their belly. So on the back, it's called the, the, um, the dorsal. And she's showing you her ventral side, which is their belly or underside. That's what ventral means. Um, and the ventral side of a corn snake is actually black and white and kind of looks like a checkerboard pattern. Or somebody, I guess, thought it looked like corn. <laughs> so they named them the corn snake is how they got their name. And on the dorsal or their back, the top side, right? She's got to be red and orange and black. And most of that will actually blend in very nicely to the background. You probably didn't even notice her right away when you turned on our live stream just now because her pattern is very, very well camouflaged to natural patterns around her, like mulch <laughs> in this case. Um, but if she were hanging out around anything natural, like like just dirt or fallen leaves and things like that in the in the forest where they live or in the wooded areas where they live, etc. Um, maybe by maybe a river or lake, there's going to be natural patterns on the ground that they would actually blend into quite nicely. And when they're wanting to just rest and hide away, they'll find somewhere to hide underneath underneath something or in a hole somewhere. And this species might even climb a tree a little bit and kind of get away that way as well. 
And in the wild, they do eat all sorts of prey. They are predators, of course. Snakes do not eat salad and fruits and vegetables. Um, they eat other animals. And this species is an active hunter. They're not a type of snake that's going to just sit still and wait for food to come by. They might just venture off and look for their own food. They might even climb trees and look for young birds or eggs or maybe even other birds too when they get older too and they can actually eat bigger birds and things. Now for this snake, they're not gonna get huge. So probably the biggest bird they could ever eat was maybe like, hmm, like some some kind of songbird or something like that maybe a little larger like that I, I i don't than that i should say i don't think that they would ever eat like a dove or something like that that's a little bit too large for this species even when full grown but uh they do eat birds sometimes and when on the ground they can eat frogs and lizards and all sorts of things they're not really known to eat other snakes it's never a good idea to cohabitate two snakes together on, on the long term. Sometimes snakes can be kept together just fine, like garter snakes, for example, do very well socially. And some snakes do fine on a temporary or for a temporary amount of time, like some baby snakes do okay for a little while, but it's really a good idea to plan to separate them, especially when feeding time is around, is, is going on, I should say, um, because some snakes will get very enthusiastic about anything that moves and want to eat them especially snakes like milk snakes and bull snakes and especially king snakes like Slytherin. You probably saw Slytherin before in the past. Slytherin is our California king snake. We also have Jared, our desert king snake, who is another snake that we regularly sometimes feed on the live stream because he's an excellent eater when it comes to anything, including my hands. <laughs> sometimes he wants to eat me too. So we don't handle him a whole lot. But Slytherin or California king snake is a great handling animal. But the, the different types of king snakes and milk snakes and bull snakes and other snakes like indigos and even cobras will eat each other too. So it's never really a good idea to keep snakes together because you never know what they're gonna do, right? <laughs> now, unless you are, of course, a professional breeder or you are a herpetologist and you're doing something special with your two snakes, um, I'm not talking to you guys, I'm talking to the novelist or new people, or even just the, the average person keeping reptiles, you may not know that they cannot really be cohabitated. But these guys are normally going to eat rodents. That is what where they get the name the rat snake, which the red rat snake is what this is. It's also the corn snake the same animal with two different names, and they are in the rat snake family. Rat doesn't mean they just eat rats. That means they eat rodents in general. So mice and hamsters and things like that for the rat snakes in general. So these guys will mostly eat like mice, but they also eat birds and bird eggs and things like that. So she's a good eater too. And when she comes back around, I might go ahead and just offer her her mouse. She is going to be getting a mouse. The mouse is not alive. So please don't worry. Um, it is not that kind of show. We do not show animals hunting and eating live animals on the live stream. We don't really record that for entertainment or anything like that. We wanna make sure that this is a nice family show, although it is natural for them to do so. It's also not the nicest to let your snake eat a live rodent. Um, number one, it is a little bit more cruel to the rodent and also it can endanger your snake. If you think about it, if you're a mouse getting eaten by a snake, are you going to be happy about that? Probably not. And you have sharp teeth, you have claws, and you are probably going to fight. Um, so sometimes a rat, especially, or a mouse, sometimes for smaller snakes, can really hurt your snakes. So it's never a good idea, if you can help it, to feed your snakes a live feeder. That means a live rodent or a live bird or, heaven forbid, a live rabbit. Do not feed your larger snakes live rabbit. That is not a good idea. Some snakes are so large that they have to eat rabbit and pigs and other things like that. But most people that keep those larger snakes, they know better than to feed them live animals. And we certainly don't film that for entertainment purposes. So we're not gonna be feeding a live rodent. We're gonna be feeding a rodent that has already passed away and has been humanely euthanized and has been frozen and then thawed out properly, nice and warm, nice and thawed for our beautiful snake here to eat. And that's gonna happen in just a little bit. But I do wanna warn you guys ahead of time, we are going to be feeding a passed away rodent, a feeder to our snake in just a little bit, okay? Snakes, of course, don't eat salad or fruits and vegetables. This is their natural prey. They cannot uh, live off of a vegetarian diet. They can only live off of a carnivorous, carnivore meat diet <laughs> and they are hunters. I think she's about ready. If you guys are ready, I am ready to go ahead and offer her the food. I know not everybody's out there commenting right now. I'm sure you guys are just busy doing other things. You can always watch our videos later too, which is fantastic. But I just thought that I would go ahead and feed our snake for you guys. I think she is more than ready to eat. So I have her lid just cracked a little bit and I'm ready to go. Here is the feeder mouse. It looks huge on screen. 
oops, it looks huge on screen, but it's really pretty small. This is what's known as like a hopper or a small mouse. I would say that's more of a small mouse than a hopper, a little bigger. And she is absolutely ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and offer her this mouse. And she usually does coil around the mouse. There we go, that's a nice feeding response, very good. And she is going to coil around it to hold it still. It's already passed away, but she doesn't know that. So her instinct has taken over and she doesn't have um, any hands or arms. <laughs> so she's gonna give it a hug with her body instead. You saw that coiling response. She is not considered to be a constrictor, but they still do use a constricting maneuver sometimes. And uh, Harley is usually going to do that when she's. So I don't know if you guys can see, but her head is up here. I know it's very hard to see and I do apologize. It's kind of far away. I might modify the experience next time and have her closer to the camera or whoever it is. Uh, the mouse's tail is here. So she's kind of wrapped around it and she's got her head up here holding the mouse still. They're basically making sure that that animal has already passed away. Again, it's a constriction maneuver, but she's not considered to be a constrictor by um, by body type or anything like that. She's actually considered to be a colubrid. Colubrids are kind of the leftovers of the snakes. They are your rat snakes, like her, rat snakes, corn snakes. They're pretty much the same thing. Um, rat snakes, corn snakes, king snakes, bull snakes, hognose snakes, um, milk snakes, all those guys, indigo snakes. Those are the, the largest of all the colubrids in North America. And then you have all sorts of colubrids all over the world, but they're the leftovers of all the snake category categories. Um, you've got your constrictors like boas and pythons. You've got your um, your sea snakes, which are really cool. Those are venomous, but on their own kind of their own planet <laughs> in the sea, and also their own category. And then you've got your traditional venomous snakes, traditional, which are like your vipers, elapids, things like that. And then colubrids, which are actually my favorite of all the snake categories. There's so many different types of colubrids, and we have several of them here once in a while. We've got king snakes, we've got rat snakes, corn snakes, all sorts of things. So that's her. She's going to take her sweet time, I think, eating, and I will just keep teaching you guys about her. And she's usually pretty quick to finish up. Now, if you did notice, um, snakes don't have any eyelids. So they do keep their eyes open the entire time this is happening, which is so interesting if you think about it. Um, they do have a protective scale over their eye, which is like a spectacle. Um, they call it a spectacle scale. It's like a little glasses or, or goggles for your eyes that protects their eyes. They don't have to blink at all. And they don't blink. So she's kind of taking a while. Maybe it's because it's a newer environment being over here instead of in her home. She's usually pretty fast when she eats. But I think she's just being extra careful. And again, um, rats and mice in nature, they can fight back. So they have sharp teeth. They do bite. I don't really blame the mouse either for biting because they, you know, they think they're going to be able to defend themselves, um, which does happen sometimes. Sometimes snakes do get wounds and injuries from their feet, their feeders. Well, their feeders in, in the care of humans, but their prey in nature, right? She's a neat little predator. These guys are very, very easy to care for. Like I said, um, one rodent about every seven, seven to 10 days is plenty of food for them. And you wanna feed, um, a size that makes sense for your snake. She's of course not a full grown or adult sized corn snake by any means. So I've given her a pretty small mouse. It's, it's a small mouse just after being a hopper sized mouse. So, and if you're new to feeder rodents, they start off as pinkies, which is the smallest, and then they start becoming a fuzzy, and then they turn into a hopper, then a small mouse, then a medium mouse, mouse, <laughs> regular mouse, then a large mouse, and then you have like your pregnant mice or your like mama mice, which are like the biggest ones. And then, I know, <laughs> it's 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 kind of, it's just the way it is, it's the way of nature, right? But uh, anyway, so I guess she's gonna to take her sweet time. I am gonna actually um, go ahead and get our second animal, if you guys don't mind, while she is doing this over here, and she's gonna be out here the whole time. And please don't forget, if you guys have any questions about our experience today or any of the animals that we're meeting, uh, you guys are being awfully quiet today. That's okay. I understand you guys have a life outside of once in a while. And I'm so very happy that things are opening up again and you're able to get out and do more. I hope everybody's having a great um, summer so far. And I hope you guys are out of school. Yay! I know a lot of you guys are excited for your summer break. And I hope you have some fun vacations and things going on coming up. So please tell me about your fun activities coming up and your plans for the summer. I'm gonna let her take her sweet time and I'm gonna go ahead and get our second animal, but I am going to pause and walk over and get our second animal and then I'll be right back before you know it, okay? I'll be right back.
I'm not sure if she's even moved yet. So speaking of predators, we've got another little predator here who is much larger than Harley, isn't he? This is Loki and he is a ferret. Ferrets are actually the domesticated version of the European polecat, which is of course a animal found in Europe. And the European polecat is an animal um, related to weasels. In fact, they are a type of weasel. They are in the weasel family, including uh, badgers, wolverines. Um, who else is in the weasel family, Loki? Uh, otters, all sorts of animals. Ermines, weasels, of course. And the European polecat, which looks just like this, but they live in the wild. And these guys are hunters as well. So ferrets are obligate carnivores, just like snakes. <laughs> They're very different animals, of course, but they do certainly hunt for a living like a snake does. However, unlike a snake, they cannot go every seven to 10 days without eating. In fact, they must eat every single day. Ferrets are one of the few type of carnivores that eat multiple, multiple, multiple times a day. In fact, they prefer to eat about five or six times every single day, but typically get two meals a day, um, maybe three sometimes. And if they're smart enough and have enough resources, they will actually store food away and be able to eat at their leisure. This is actually one of the type of mammals in Europe that does not hibernate. And they will actually have to find food through the winter, store it away in dens underground where they usually hide out. They are a sub-terrestrial type animal or terrestrial too. They're usually hanging out on the ground, not climbing trees. <laughs> Unlike Harley Quinn the snake who sometimes is up in the trees and sometimes on the ground. We call that semi-arboreal. These guys are terrestrial pretty strictly and sub-terrestrial going underground. Typically they will take over other animals homes underground like rabbits and rabbits happen to be their main source of food as well. Um, Loki, the ferret and the European polecat in the wild, they can also eat a lot of rodents. Rodents is definitely a very common menu item for them too. So rodents and rabbits end up being their main source of food. They can also eat all sorts of animals like snakes. <laughs> Believe it or not, they can eat snakes. And speaking of eating, Harley is eating right now. I hope you can see her eating. She's uh, stuffed up here in the corner in the front. And, uh, but Loki would definitely be able to eat a corn snake or any type of snake um, that they can find. And these guys are actually pretty good hunters of even venomous snakes sometimes, kind of like mongoose. Although mongoose are not really closely related to weasels like all the mustelids like Loki is in that category, right? <laughs> That's the weasel family. Mongoose are kind of their own thing. They're in the mongoose family. And mongoose are um, also related more closely to like meerkats and things like that. So meerkats and mongoose are cousins. And then distantly related is going to be your weasels and things like that, but they're in their own family. I'm just looking at Harley Quinn now. She is using her, her very specialized jaw system to be able to eat her mouse all in one bite. Loki here, of course, would have to eat his food in bites. That's why they have totally different teeth than a snake does. A non-venomous snake has pretty wimpy teeth, to be honest with you. Their teeth are kind of more like for sticking to the animal and holding on to them while they're uh, getting ready to eat them. And then from there, their jaw will actually spread apart and stretch to be able to fit that entire rodent down in one bite. For Loki though, he would have to actually, um, maybe he's hunting a rabbit, they would actually tear the rabbit up to be able to eat it in pieces as opposed to eating it in one bite. He just cannot do that. So he's more like us or like most um, hunting animals, like mammals and things um, that have to actually tear up their food to be able to eat it in pieces. I don't know if you guys can see Harley Quinn at all. I'm trying to see, oh yes, she's peeking her head over her body there. Loki's gonna watch too. And she is actually um, basically getting the positioning of the food just right so she can swallow it whole. Most snakes will um, opt to swallow their food whole, of course, it's always whole, but head first. They're going to easily have a easier time. They're gonna have an easier time swallowing the whole prey head first because of everything being streamlined with the fur and even the legs and everything else. Now, a lot of people ask me, can a snake eat a person? And the short answer is just no. Snakes really don't eat people. One major reason that larger snakes even do not eat people is because we have really wide shoulders for um, the shape of body that we have. <laughs> so we wouldn't be easily, we wouldn't be able to be eaten easily, thank goodness, right? So most snakes really don't see us as a food source whatsoever, unless they're extremely hungry or just a very aggressive eating snake, I guess. And typically if a human 
is attacked by a snake like that, say it's a great big giant constricting snake like a reticulated python, and they just are very ambitious that day and they really want to try to eat a tiny human, <laughs> uh, it have to be a very small human, even then, if they're able to um, get you, they're not usually going to be able to swallow you. We're just too big and we're too wider on the shoulders. Now, to each his own, every person is shaped different, I guess. <laughs> so it really just kind of depends. It would have to be a very teeny tiny person, though. But that really doesn't ever happen. There are, are a ton more animals out there that are much, much more dangerous than snakes in general. Um, most animals in general um, are much more, well, not most, but a lot more animals in general are much more dangerous in general than snakes are, even the venomous ones. Most venomous snakes don't want anything to do with you whatsoever. In fact, they'd much rather get away, slither away, and avoid you because they're scared of you. We're not a food source for them, especially small snakes, right? And uh, they just want to get away because we are big and scary. So Harley is maneuvering her jaws to be able to eat her mouth. Can you see? And Loki is actually licking some treats off of my fingers, which are chicken flavored baby food treats today. Um, that is their favorite thing to kind of stay busy with while they're doing programs or even just here on the live stream. Otherwise, ferrets are wanting to run around and party all the time. So ferrets are kind of funny because they're either sleeping really hard and dreaming, and they even go into what is called a dead sleep sometimes, where they don't move, and they barely look like they're breathing, and they look dead. You can even shake them, and it looks like they have passed away. It's really scary if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, but they are breathing, and they are just fine. They're just going into a very deep sleep. So they're either kind of sleeping really hard, or they're up wanting to eat or play all the time. They are super playful, super active. Again, they have a super high metabolism for an animal like this. Most predatory type mammals out there in the wild, they're eating about once a day, maybe. Um, for example, like a wolf. Wolves will find um, food to usually together in a group, right? Little wolf pack and uh, in a family pack basically. And they will kind of eat once a day, usually. Maybe if they can find food that day. They don't necessarily have to eat every day. Dogs are actually okay not eating every single day. It's not ideal for them to skip a meal like that, but they can definitely survive. Ferrets, however, and all the weasel family, like the, the otters and the badgers, wolverines, and the European polecat, which is where the ferret like Loki comes from, from the wild. This is a domesticated version. Um, they have to eat multiple times a day, or they can actually become very sick. It's not good for a ferret to go without food for a, for a while. They like to eat all the time, kind of like me. I like to eat all the time too. <laughs> so right now he's licking some treats off my fingers, like I said, which is chicken flavored baby food. If you're just joining us, we also have a snake down here who is in her tank right here in the front corner. Can you see right there? Loki and I are pointing at her and uh, she's actually eating a mouse for us. Oh, there's a nice big wide bite. She's kind of like, ah, like eating the mouse. And again, they don't chew their food at all. They swallow their food whole. So they actually have to uh, maneuver to be able to swallow it in one gulp. And since they're reptiles and they are cold-blooded or ectothermic, um, they don't have to eat every day like warm-blooded mammals do or like they want to do, right, Loki? So Loki is a great big ferret, right? He is actually a ferret hybrid. If you guys are new here, this is Loki. He's one of the largest and prettiest ferrets I've ever seen. And he looks exactly like they do in the wild, which is the European pole cat. He does weigh, <laughs> how much do you weigh now? About three pounds. They do fluctuate in their weight. And right now he's kind of a chunkier weight, which is normal for a male ferret or a hog. Ha ha ha. He is neutered. He was neutered actually later in life than most ferrets are. And so he maintained his very large size. And he is also a ferret hybrid to a European polecat. So he's part European polecat, which is like the wild version. And he's mostly domesticated ferret. Ferrets were actually domesticated a long time ago, about 2,500 to, to 3,000 years ago, back in Europe. And they were originally brought into humans' lives for hunting purposes, not to hunt them, to help them hunt with us. And there goes Harley eating her mouse. She finally did it. So she has almost finished the body of the mouse and now the tail remains and is sticking out of her mouth. See that? <laughs> you love ferrets, Philip. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for commenting. If you guys have questions about our animals so far, please let me know. If you're just joining us, this is Loki the ferret and this is Harley Quinn the uh, corn snake. That's what she is. <laughs> She's an Okichi corn snake. Hello, wild interviews with Fabricio Lazarde. Lazarde, is that how you pronounce that? 
Yes, so most ferrets are actually smaller than Loki. Loki is a hybrid. He's also a holistic ferret. That means that he did not come from Marshall Farms, where most of the ferrets in the United States actually come from. Um, he was specially bred by a very, very good breeder here in Texas. She, she's actually out of Houston. And he is actually a hybrid. His mom was part European polecat. And um, he was raised on raw meat his whole life and still is eating raw meat. He only gets the special treat when he's being um, when he's being trained or if he's in shows like the live stream today or in public shows and things like that. And we give him special treats like chicken baby food, but that is also um, raw meat too, <laughs> right? Well, chicken baby food, I guess, is cooked meat technically, but it's okay on occasion. Most of his diet is going to be um, raw meat, so not cooked. He gets bones, he gets organs, he gets all sorts of different options to eat, like mice and rats and chicken and beef. <laughs> what else do you get? Quail, all sorts of things. Fish sometimes. I can't remember everything else <laughs> off the top of my head. So that's why he's a little bit bigger. There's a lot of factors. He was also not neutered early in his life. Most ferrets are neutered way, way too young. And so it kind of stunts their growth and gives them all sorts of potential health problems. He wasn't neutered until later in life. So he was almost, a, I wanna say he was around 10 months or 11 months old when he was neutered. It's almost a year old. But thank you for noticing that he's so big. And he's also just kind of a larger guy. Yeah, he is a sable, which is the standard color for these guys. That is like the wild type color as well. That's usually what they look like. They kind of have a cute little mask like a raccoon. They are not related to raccoons whatsoever. Want to hang on to me? They are not related to raccoons whatsoever. Raccoons are in their own family too. And they are related to coatis, also known as coatamundi, and to kinkajous, which are um, two animals in the Americas. So relatives of the, of the raccoon, as far as I know, all come from, from the Americas. And these guys are in the weasel family, which come from all over the place. And there are many different types of weasel type animals and different types of ferrets too. So there are two species of ferrets. One is the domestic variety, which he is which remember was domesticated over 2000 years ago. We think around 3000 years ago is when they were first kind of brought into human lives. And about 2,500, around 2000-ish years ago, they were fully domesticated and uh, considered to be a separate species from the European polecat. There's also another species of ferret called the black-footed ferret, which is a species in the United States. Um, and they are actually an endangered species. Unfortunately, you've probably heard of them. They live in the American plains. And uh, scientists as well as zookeepers um, in North America are actually working on um, their conservation to get their numbers back up, which is fantastic. Most of their issues is going to come from habitat loss and also um, losing their prey. So the main prey of the black-footed ferret, which is a species that is wild in the United States, is going to be um, the prairie dog. And actually prairie dogs started becoming more and more scarce due to habitat loss and all sorts of other issues. And I'm sure way more things. And um, the black-footed ferret started becoming more scarce too because that is their food. They cannot survive without their food. And again, these animals, most weasels need to eat multiple, multiple, multiple times a day to thrive and do well in the wild. <laughs> you can see his beautiful long coat. Um, ferrets and European polecats, I guess, would be the proper way to say that in the wild. European polecats um, do not hibernate, so they do grow longer fur, usually in the winter, but since he's a domestic ferret living in air conditioning, he's a little confused right now, but I think he's beautiful, so I'm not gonna complain. That long hair that he has is typically great for the winter time. Also, he has gained some weight. So he's actually kind of a little bit chunky right now. And that would also help them survive during the long winters. And typically they're going to store away all sorts of meat for the winter in order to be able to eat um, for that time period when there is less food available, right, Loki? You can see how active they are. These guys really never stop moving unless they are just sleeping, 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 like totally asleep. Otherwise, they just want to play, they want to eat, they want to see what's going on. There's a lid here, so Harley is fine, but they do eat snakes. <laughs> so I'm sure he's very curious about the snake down there, as well as the mouse smell. And he's probably just wanting more treats as well. Oh, you have a deaf ferret. That's actually kind of cool. Um, that's very educational to talk about. A lot of the special colors of ferrets, including white or blaze like you have, um, et cetera, a lot of them end up being deaf, kind of like white dogs sometimes. So that's um, honestly um, kind of a special needs thing that they, that they um, sometimes end up with, unfortunately, which they actually can get around pretty well being deaf. I'm sure you know this. And she's older. So was she deaf already? 
or is she deaf because she's older now? Because that happens to a lot of animals, of course. And you would like another ferret. So we always recommend, um, like, if you give ferrets in general, that they should have a buddy or a friend to live with. Ferrets are very social in uh, homes. <laughs> um, in the wild, they're a little less social. Sometimes you'll see them living together in a group called a business. Um, and typically, that's going to be females with their babies, and they just kind of decide to hang out together. Um, but they're a little less social in the wild. But in your home, they tend to want to hang out with other ferrets um, get along very, very well. There's always exceptions to the rule, but they're kind of like dogs. They're very social in the care of humans. And uh, Loki here does have a brother that's an adopted brother, and he's a white ferret named, named Thor. This is Loki. Uh, the other one is Thor. I get them mixed up sometimes because I have so many children. <laughs> um, but Thor is a white ferret with dark eyes. He's not deaf and he's not albino. And uh, he actually came from the same source as Loki. So also another holistic ferret and doing very, very well. He's a little bit smaller than Loki because remember Loki is a hybrid. So he's gonna be naturally a little bit bigger. And, uh, but Thor is still a pretty large ferret. Yes, she was deaf at, when you got her, I see. Yes, from the pet store. That is actually pretty common with those special colored ferrets sometimes, especially the ones with the white markings on their face, unfortunately, but I'm sure you love her. Um, just as much, even if she is deaf. <laughs> and uh, I know I have several people actually that have deaf ferrets. They get around pretty well, especially in human care where they're not going to be in danger in any way, right? Right, Loki, you're so pretty. So these guys are wonderfully um, flexible. That's one of my favorite things to show, especially in person, is how flexible they are. You can see how they kind of rock back and forth. Their spines are one of the more flexible spines of all the mammals. He can do a little bend here. He can even bend his whole body up and do a sit up with no problem, but he can bend his body right like a U right here. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. They're very, very slinky, like a, like a living slinky. And that is actually to be able to fit in tunnels. Even this chunker here can actually fit into tunnels underground. And if they hit a dead end, they can actually just bend their body the other way and turn around and get back out instead of having to back up. They can also back up too, if they just can't bend around, but that helps them to get into and out of very sticky situations underground. And because of that, some ferrets were actually trained, some domestic ferrets were trained to be able to go into small spaces to hunt vermin and also to even help with like stringing, um, what do you call it, like cables through small spaces where they can't um, get electric cables through. Otherwise they would kind of put them on the ferrets in some way. I guess they're attach them to the ferrets and then call them across and have like food on the other end. And as you can see, they love their food. So it's very possible to train them for all sorts of cool, cool stuff. But the reason that they were domesticated or brought into human care at all in the first place was because of their hunting skills. These guys can hunt things like rodents and rabbits very, very easily, very efficiently. And they're actually a little bit easier to house and manage than having like dogs or even cats. Um, so that became a very popular animal to hunt with. And when they started spontaneously actually having albino ferrets that were born, um, the albino ferrets ended up becoming like kind of a neat special um, uh, thing that happened. And they thought that that was really cool. Um, but also the albino ferrets would mostly just like stand out in the field a little bit too much than the darker ferrets that are naturally camouflaged, right? The darker animals like this on the field, especially at dawn and dusk when they're mostly hunting, like the rabbits and things. Rabbits are crepuscular and so are ferrets. That means they're more active at dawn in the morning and dusk when the sun is setting. So darker ferrets will be able to hide a little bit better than light white albino ferrets too. And again, some of them are probably deaf as well sometimes, so they couldn't really hunt as well. So the white ferrets would end up in people's homes just as pets, so animal companions. And they would often be gifted to like really rich people, like kings and queens and lords and ladies and things like that. So that's when they started becoming more of like a pet type animal, it was because of the white ferret. Isn't that interesting? The spontaneous albino. And then years and years and years later, we started breeding special colors and all sorts of markings on ferrets. And now they come in almost every color you can think of that like a dog comes in. Pretty cool. So you said um, you love ferrets, but they are super cute, but so uncommon where you live. Yeah. So ferrets are not necessarily the right pet for everybody. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, in my opinion. 
that they're not that common. I think that a lot of people adopt a ferret and think that they're going to be an easy pet that you can just kind of put away into an enclosure or cage and then forget about them. And they're not like that at all. In fact, no animal is like that. Rabbits are not like that. Guinea pigs are not like that. Mice and rats and gerbils are not really like that either. Mice and rats and gerbils and guinea pigs, I would say can live in an enclosure pretty well, but rabbits and ferrets need a lot of room. And ferrets can be kept in an enclosure sometimes, but then they need exercise and they need playtime and training and certainly a lot of cleanup. Most ferrets are very stinky and smelly and they do poop a lot. <laughs> so these ferrets eat a lot and our ferrets eat raw meat. So they do use the restroom. Although when you raise them on raw meat, they use the restroom less than they do when they eat kibble. Uh, ferrets are obligate carnivores. That means they should be eating meat and only meat. And that's what they eat in the wild. And they should be getting organs and bones and things like that. However, a lot of um, ferrets that are kept in human care are raised on kibble and they don't easily switch over to a healthy diet of raw meat. There goes Harley. I guess she's all done with her mouse. Um, and then it is a little bit, you just have health problems with them because there's a lot of fillers in kibble, even though some kibble is better than others, there's still going to be fillers and extra things that they don't need. So a lot of that is going to come out as extra poop. <laughs> some of that is going to manifest as diseases and issues. And uh, so we're trying our very best to raise our, our ferrets on raw meat and a raw diet, just like they would have in the wild, right? Or even better than the wild because it's nice and clean. So I'm sorry to say, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend ferrets for everybody. They do tend to have health issues. Like I said, they're very high maintenance. They do require their yearly shots, vaccines, all that, um, especially the rabies vaccine, but they also require distemper as well. They can get a disease called canine distemper, which is 100% deadly in ferrets. And they do need their vaccines every single year. That's extremely important for ferrets. Also, they can get into anything and everything and they do bite sometimes. They're not a great pet for everybody, but for the right family with the right research, um, they are wonderful animal companions sometimes. Isn't that right, Loki? And they're awfully beautiful and they're awfully cute. And they're a lot of fun. They do make me laugh every single day. <laughs> and sometimes he goes for my ear. <laughs> Maybe he's looking at my earring or looking for more treats. But they're super curious. And uh, they're super worth it in this case, though. And he's a great education animal, isn't he? And they're very smart. You can even teach them to do all sorts of tricks and behaviors. And uh, they seem to really want to be with you and look to you for things and want to be interested in what you're doing. And they certainly are adorable. Well, good job, Loki. I'm going to go ahead and put him up. I'm going to um, pause to go put Loki away. And I'm actually going to return with our third animal because we brought three today. We have our corn snake here who has just eaten a mouse, if you missed it, and Loki the ferret. And then I'm going to actually go and get our third animal in just a second. Say bye, Loki. Everybody thinks you're beautiful and lovely. I'll be right back. Sorry, you guys, for taking so long. I had to put Loki away and then collect our final animal, which is our third species, right? So here at Once in a Wild, we have over 70 animal individuals and many species of animals. And I thought I would bring a bird for you guys to see for our final animal of the evening. Come on. Come here. <laughs> Evie's back, you guys. It's been a little bit since Evie's been on the program. 
So don't forget, we had our corn snake, Harley Quinn, getting fed. And she's right here hanging out with us and still on the table. And then we have Loki, the domestic ferret, who's also a hybrid of a European polecat and ferret. And now we have our beautiful cockatiel, Evie. Evie is one of three cockatiels that we have here at Once in a Wild. And he is one of our males. Our two other cockatiels are actually unknown genders. We think that they're male and female. And that's Dandy and Sunny. And then we have Evie, who is 100% boy. He is super sassy. He's not necessarily used to the snake being out here. So it may take him a minute to get used to seeing the snake. It's okay. It's contained. You'll be all right. But if he wants to go perch up there for a little bit and come back, uh, that is okay too. I'm going to turn this down just a little bit. Maybe that'll help him calm down. Remember, our animals do whatever they want. We can't force them to do anything. Come here, buddy. It is okay. I know that a snake is your natural predator and enemy, but I'm not going to let her get you. It's okay. I'm sure he'll calm down in just a little bit. Let me see what you guys have to say. Oh, I see. I'm sorry to hear about your ferret, Philip. I know that does happen sometimes, right? That's one of the worst parts about um, having animals is sometimes we have to say goodbye to them. It's okay, Evie. It's okay. He's like leaning away from the snake. I'm going to block her with my body. It is okay, Evie. So Evie's a wonderful cockatiel. He's actually the natural color that most cockatiels are in the wild. And he is gray with white on the front of his wings there when he's at rest. And he has a beautiful yellow face and orange cheeks, which are a feature of all cockatiels, as long as they're the natural color. Cockatiels, just like ferrets, have been in human care for a long time. So we've been able to, as humans, um, actually breed all sorts of colors and mutations and morphs of cockatiels. And uh, But this is actually the original color that they come in and the wild color that they come in. Can I have you step this way and people can see you a little bit better? Don't leave. As you can see, the Evie is actually fully flighted. Come here. It's okay. I promise. I'm not going to feed you to the snake. <laughs> she already ate. <laughs> He's like, I don't know about this. He's perched up here on my ring light. It's okay. It's okay, my love. I know. If we really have to, we can move her. But I think you're all right. Sometimes we got to face our fears. So here at Once in a While, we actually specialize in... Uh, you guys facing your fears, if you happen to be afraid of snakes or afraid of bugs or spiders or scorpions, there's all sorts of different animals that some people have phobias or just apprehensions about. Some people are a little bit nervous around birds too. I've met people that are nervous around birds. It's okay, Evie, I promise. And you'll notice that the, the more he eats and the more full he becomes, the less he's going to be interested in listening to me. But I do have his favorite treats, just like I brought the favorite treats of the ferret earlier. When we train our animals, we definitely want to bring their favorite foods. For snakes, it's a little bit different because they really only eat one type of thing, which is meat items like mice, sometimes birds, eggs, things like that. And snakes don't eat every day. So it's a little bit hard to train a snake by giving them treats. <laughs> so they're a little bit different. So we train our snakes, train our snakes or habituate our snakes to handling just by getting them used to a good experience with handling. With birds, they do eat every day and they eat multiple times a day and they have fast metabolism. Step up. Good boy. Just gonna keep on feeding him treats. That way he knows this is a good experience. And eventually he'll probably just be desensitized to this slithering animal next to him. And if he's not, that's okay. Evie is our most nervous of all of our cockatiels out of the three. He tends to be a little bit um, nervous in new situations. And even though he's been in this studio many, many, many times, hundreds of times, um, especially with practicing with him in here, hundreds of times total, he probably hasn't seen a snake too many times in here. So he is a little bit nervous about the snake and that is totally normal, but it looks like he still wants to come down and get treats. So he is actually in the parrot family. All the cockatiels are like that. And all the cockatoos are like that. They are actually a parrot too. They're a parrot species. How do we know he's a parrot? Well, he has a curved beak that points downward and is very strong. Parrots have a specialized beak as well that can actually lift their entire body weight and climb very easily. They can even hang upside down by their face, which is pretty impressive. And they can also crunch and open up seeds, including millet like this. Millet is actually a very, very easy seed to eat. I'm gonna face him away from the snake and come back with a treat in his face so he stays with me. Yeah, um, distract him with food. <laughs> food or fear? We wanna make sure that he chooses food, right? Because there's nothing to fear right now. He's actually perfectly safe. I have him in a very safe spot away from the snake. Even though he can see it, he might have a little bit um, of a visual reaction to that, right? <laughs> but anyway, because parrots are very visual. 
But parrots have that strong curved beak, which is designed for eating seeds and nuts and all sorts of hard foods like that. In bigger parrots, it's even stronger, right? They can crunch and open up things like walnuts and hazelnuts very, very easily. Right now he's just eating millet and he's a small bird. So millet ends up being his kind of favorite treat of all. And that's why we use it, right? Just like I said, we want to use something positive that he really, really loves. Stay there, Evie. There you go. Good boy. But that's what their beak is for. And it's also for climbing as well. And it can be for biting for defense too. But when you're a tiny parrot like this, you don't really bite very often. And um, cockatiels of all the parrots in my experience have one of the weakest and <laughs> least strong. That's the same thing. The, the weakest bites of all the parrots. And that actually makes them uh, pretty easy to work with because they're not gonna be able to really bite that hard. Um, but they also have other features that make them parrots. Another one is gonna be their toes. Can you see Evie's toes? He's got two toes in the front and his toes are split with two toes in the back. So two toes facing front and two toes facing back. That gives them an even and strong grip on a tree branch or when they're climbing the side of their enclosure or up a tree when they don't feel like flying. They can climb very easily with their beak and two feet very, very, very easily. And they can even hang on to a branch a little bit easier than other bird species that have three toes in the front and one in the back. For the most part, the toe placement that parrots have and some other birds too, like owls, for example, they just get a stronger grip. That also allows some parrots to use their feet for like little hands and pick up a piece of food and eat it. Cockatiels aren't really known for that very often for whatever reason, they don't choose to do that very often, um, but they could if they really wanted to because they do have that toe placement. The proper name for that toe placement is actually zygodactyl, which is one of my favorite words in all of words. <laughs> and, uh, a zygodactyl just means two toes in the front and two toes in the back. You want to fly? Oh, good boy. See, everything's okay. I will never let the snake hurt you, <laughs> even though the snake is in the same room as you. Now, Evie does not live in the same room as all of our reptiles live. Our reptiles actually have their own room, and our opossums are actually in that room, but they don't seem to have very much of a fear of the reptiles looking at them and things. Um, I wouldn't really want to keep the birds in with animals like that because they might have a little bit more of a stress response to predators like that. And there's no predators in their room except for hedgehogs, which do not affect birds <laughs> and do not hunt birds. Hedgehogs actually do hunt, but they hunt things like bugs, insects, worms, things like that. So they're insectivores. There you go. There's lots of treats in my hand now for you, Evie. This is a little bit of an awkward <laughs> position for me, and I dropped the treats. That's okay. We'll change positions. Good. Good boy. So what was I saying? The birds are not in with the snakes and the other lizards and reptiles and things. Those guys have their own room. Also, our birds are flighted. As you saw, um, Evie actually flies around a little bit if he wants to. He's only here by choice. I'm not forcing him to be here. He's in a room with me, but he could leave and go fly up on a bookshelf or the ring light again if he wants to. And uh, that's not really a good idea when you have a lot of electronics like heat lamps and um, electricity <laughs> and uh, heat heat um, pads and cords and things like that in a room. You don't want your birds flying around and actually getting after those things. Um, our birds do have free roam of their room throughout the day and they're just put up at night and put up to eat so they can all have their own food bowls and things. Otherwise they're gonna steal each other's food and things. So they're, they actually share a room um, well with other birds that are around the same size. We don't put big birds with small birds. Our ducks are actually outside. They live very well outside like that. They're a lot messier than our small birds, so they get to live outside and they enjoy it anyway. And they get to have water features and things to swim around in. And then our small birds, which include our cockatiels, our budgie, our doves, and that's it. Um, they share the room with our bunny rabbit, Sandor, and our hedgehog and guinea pigs. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody, but I believe that's everybody in that particular room. So those are all animals that for the most part get along okay the hedgehogs are actually put away and they have a lid on their enclosure so they're not really anything to worry about and then um that's how they like it they like to be by themselves in a nice warm enclosed area and uh so they're not really used to seeing the snakes which is my point of that whole story <laughs> uh, so evie isn't really used to seeing harley quinn whatsoever and instinctively he knows that um snakes are probably dangerous for him right he is super cool. After he finishes this treat, I'm gonna show you what he loves to do the most. First of all, he's gonna come back to me. Come here, come here. Good job, he's gonna come back, get a little treat. And then Evie really loves himself. That is his favorite thing on the planet is looking at himself in the mirror. We don't provide him mirrors all the time. Sometimes he does find reflective surfaces to um, look at himself, but 
sometimes just for special occasions like shows, we will give him a little mirror like this. I just have a tiny one here. What was that? I've never seen him do that before. You lost your, your mirror friend. You want to switch sides? That's fine. Say hi. Hi. What do you think? Did you just want to switch sides? He's usually on this side. So Evie can talk. He is a parrot and can mimic noises. Give us a little kiss. That's good. What about a spray bottle? A little dance. That's a spray bottle. Good job. Can you whisper? That's a spray bottle. Okay, hurry up. Sometimes spray bottle doesn't stop. So that's him mimicking me cleaning up. I do a lot of cleaning around here and so do all of us. You whisper. You can do it. I know you want to. Whisper. That's a nice little kiss. He does say a lot of things, but I can't force him to say whatever I want him to say, to say right? So sometimes we just catch what we get. He might be a little bit nervous because of the snake, but it's always good for him to get over his fears. Just like you guys can get over your fears. We actually provide um, animal therapy sessions with animals you might be a little bit nervous around. And we can give you good experiences with animals you might be nervous around. Evie, you don't want to hang out with your friend in the mirror today. Are you hungry? He might be a little hungry. He might be a little nervous. What do you think? Are you pretty? Yes, very pretty. There you go. Good job, Evie. Kisses. So Evie's actually a pretty talkative cockatiel. They're not all like this. Most of them do whistle and make noises. Of course, they can all make noises. And most parrot species, very good, are pretty loud. Cockatiels are pretty low on the volume, but they are very noisy. And males are noisier than females. Do you think you're beautiful? I think so. Nice kiss. Can you whisper? There you go. That's the whisper I was looking for earlier. And spray bottle. Again. Just the one. You're so silly. So birds are also another animal that I don't really recommend for everybody. They're very high maintenance. They're much more my hmm, they're much more high maintenance <laughs> than the ferrets, even. <clears throat> the corn snake of all three of these animals, I would say the corn snake is probably the best pet option for most people. If you're into reptiles, just because they're very, very low maintenance. Overall, they still require care, of course. But you're a treat. Come here. He also says, come here sometimes. Step up. Step up. No. Oh, step up. You don't get something for nothing. Step up. Good. Now you get the treat. Yeah, it's the snake. I think he's just a little bit nervous. That's pretty normal. Birds are prey animals for the most part. There are some birds that are predators too, right? But most um, birds that people would have in their homes are like parrots or maybe doves or pigeons ducks, chickens, things like that. It might be in your backyard. They are prey animals. So a lot of them, they do feel nervous around predators, <laughs> including us. So that takes a lot of training to get them used to you and to get them used to other household things that happen or other zoo animals in our case that happen. Turn this down a little bit. And um, that's just the way they are. But I'm glad that he participated anyway, even with this new experience. You can sit on my shoulder. Would you like that? Would you feel safer? Come here. It's okay. Step up. Good. You want to sit here? There you go. That's a little bit safer. And I bet he feels a little safer right there. Good boy. Well, you guys, I know it's been a little bit of a hot mess today. I really appreciate those of you that watched. And if you want to check out the first part of the video where we actually fed our beautiful corn snake, Harley Quinn, you can actually rewind and go back to the beginning once we're done. Um, we definitely appreciate your subscriptions on YouTube. That helps us out quite a bit. And that's a free way to help us out too, right? So thank you very much. You can also follow us on all of our social media and links for that are at onceinawhile.com as well as in the description box down below. And if you wanna help us out, we do have a donation box on onceinawhile.com all the way at the bottom or at onceinawhile.com I should say. And those donation options are your um, 
your options for you to donate to us rather are Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, and Amazon Wishlist. You can also schedule your own animal encounter while it's a lot more streamlined than this was today. <laughs> and you can actually select the animals that you would like to meet for your virtual experience or for your in-person experience if you happen to be in our area, which is San Antonio, Texas and surrounding cities. So we'd love to help you out with an animal encounter of some sort. If not, we'd love to see you next week on the live stream. We do stream every single Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Time for free right here on YouTube and right here on Facebook. If you guys want to watch us ne next week, you never know what's going to happen here at Once in a While. This is real life and it is live. <laughs> so thank you so very much for um, joining us today. You're asking Jed, Zygodactyl, does that relate to dinosaurs? I'm sure it does. I know um, any type of foot with two toes in the front and two toes in the back is considered Zygodactyl. I'm not sure that dinosaurs have Zygodactyl feet, but if you think about it, birds are really just tiny feathered dinosaurs, aren't they? that have uh, turned into birds. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> is the short answer for your question that you asked. And uh, Evie's just a little crazy dinosaur, isn't he? You wanna talk to yourself some more? Yes, he does. <laughs> oh, Sebastian, no problem, Sebastian. It's good to see you as well. Evie says hi, but we're gonna say bye. And I appreciate you guys um, joining in. We hope to see you next week. And we'll go ahead and say bye, you guys. We are not Alrighty, you guys, we'll see you next time here at Once in a Wild Wednesday. Bye. Say bye, Evie. He says bye. <laughs>